welcome to School of the Bible. Here at School of the Bible, we like to take, oh, I don't know, 15 verses, and in 15 minutes, talk about them, relate them, maybe encapsulate them, maybe bring a perspective that you hadn't thought of in your own Bible study or your own examination of the Word of God, because everyone, as we know, has heard that old expression, read the Bible, or seven days without the Word makes one week. Well, that's not true, but it's a nice thought to make you do something that maybe you don't want to do, but you know you ought to do, and that is read the Bible or study the Bible. Now, I happen to like <coughs> studying the Bible. One of the things that happens for me when I study the Bible is that I get so full I have to teach it because it just overflows from me. I mean, it just really, I can't sit down and just do a Bible study for myself. It just drives me nuts. It's like I got to get it out and get with it or get it somehow going somewhere else other than inside, but have it bounce outside. So we try to keep it short and simple and sweet. You know, we take 15 minutes to get through 15 verses and we're in Samuel, or are we in Samuel? No, we're in 2 Samuel 15, 15, which simply means we're in the second book of the book called Samuel or the second book of Kings and we are reading the first 15 verses <clears throat> but I wanted to mention that I really do love studying the Bible and there's a real simple reason you see when I read the Bible and I ask God to inspire it to me then he by his Holy Spirit causes it to kind of apply in some way not as an old history book, which is what it is, or as a law document, which is what it is, or as some type of collection of poetry, which is what it is, but by the inspiration of it, I am connected with God to His Spirit, with my spirit, causing the words to become His words spoken to me and directly applied for my life. And I like that because, you see, that means that every time I read it, I get something different from the Holy Spirit. He can apply it to me in a different way, a different means, an opportunity to make it somehow fit in a way that maybe you'll listen and it'll fit for you. Because we sometimes use the word coincidence, but that's not the only way God works through circumstance. He works through personal application. Now, for me, I'm kind of spoiled. You know, God speaks to me direct. I mean, I don't have any problem with that. God you know, whispers in my ear all the time. I mean, you know, no. <laughs> okay, he doesn't always whisper. Sometimes he's very blunt. No. But other times, you know, he whispers in my ear to the left, the right, whatever. And um, I, I guess I'm spoiled, but I take it for granted. I thought everybody had, you know, that relationship with God. And then I found out they don't. And I was kind of taken back by that, you know. And I'm still kind of dealing with that because I'm kind of like, well, why not? I mean, why aren't you hearing from God? I mean, you know, it's kind of, you know, but, but anyways, besides hearing from him direct and besides hearing from him, you know, by object or by person, meaning that he can do objectively or personally, meaning that he can use a person to speak to me, he, by his spirit, applies those things to my life as he chooses to use them in my life. And that's how he does in the Word when I'm studying it, and I like it. That's what makes me like the Word. Otherwise, I wouldn't even read the Bible. I read it once or twice. You know, I can remember it. You know, I can pretty much go through from Genesis to Revelation, tell you what's in every book of the Bible. But that's just because of the way I read. You know, I remember it. I'm not, you know, I'm not one of those guys that can retain it, but, you know, I read it, and it somehow just, you know, connects. The dots all connect. But anyways, for those who don't hear any other way, then this is the way that God speaks to them. And God speaks bluntly, you know, sometimes, or peculiarly, and he allows me sometimes to highlight that. So what we're reading today is in 1 Samuel, as we said, Samuel 15, 15, as we call it, you know, at the study of the Bible, school of the Bible. And it's a part of the Vidivo Church Ministry, Vidivo Ministry. Um, and my name is Michael James Stone, in case anybody was wondering about all that. You know, sometimes we don't do that, sometimes we do, you know what I mean? God's got a word for you. <laughs> you catch all that sign language? Oh, well. If not, don't worry about it. Now, it came to pass, after...
after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had abode two days in Ziglag, it came to pass, it came, oh boy, let me move this Bible down a little bit more. There we go. It came even, oh boy, you even got the wrong glasses. It came even to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. And so it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. Obeisance means, you know, bow down and worship or, you know, acknowledge, hey, you're, you're in charge. Sorry, don't kill me. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, That the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan his son are dead? And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he had looked upon him, he saw me and called unto me, and I answered him, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish has come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown which was upon his head, and the bracelet that was upon his arm, and I brought them hither unto my Lord. Then David took hold of his clothes and rent them, and likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until even for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord, for the house of Israel, because they were fallen by the sword. And David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered and said, I am the son of a stranger, an Amalekite. And David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. Now, that's kind of an interesting story. You know, you kind of get a gist of this could go a lot of different ways. <laughs> you know, and I've heard a lot of different stories told about the ways that it's gone. This isn't the particular one about touching God's anointed. That was someplace else. This is about someone who is either telling a story, which, you know, sounds like a very interesting story, you know, when you kind of think about it. Here the enemy comes to David and says, hey, uh... This is what happened. This is bad news and good news, you know, but I brought you some news, so here's the news. And let me give you the news. The news is, hey, you know, Saul's dead. You know, and I know you don't like him, but he's dead anyways. You know, I saw Jonathan, you know, and you loved him, but he's dead. But, um, you know, I'm an Amalekite, you know, and I'm one of the guys that actually did it. And by the way, um, I did it. Oh, okay. You know, and so some people think, well, you know, well, the guy was just doing his duty, you know, he was like maybe he's supposed to bring it to David or was he trying to give David the business you know I mean I have to say it because we got Donald Trump in office and he's really giving the public some business you know I didn't know that they were talking to the Russians really I mean I didn't mean it when I talked about Hillary so bad you know that the Russians have stuff on her you know and I didn't know that they did or you know that they got stuff on me too but we are talking about that Never mind, my dossier is being proven true. But, you know, it was like, hey, you know, I'm just, you know, kind of like didn't know. And now I got to fire my guy because, you know, after all, I mean, it's so obvious that, you know, he's busted. Somebody's got to be a scapegoat. And as a matter of fact, the man said he was a scapegoat. Now, why would he say that as a national security advisor unless, guess what? Just like the Amalekite, there's more to the story. And that's what I find interesting in these first 15 verses. There's more to this story because we hear very clearly, you know, all of a sudden, you know, there's at the very beginning, it's like, hey, you know, now it came to pass after the death of Saul where David was returning to the king and devote two days in Ziklag. 
he came to pass on the third day that behold a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes ran and earth upon his head and so was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance you know now his clothes are torn he's got dirt we don't know if he was rent because they were rent by mourning for Saul or they were rent because they were like you know hmm because we're gonna pull a fast one here you know we got to do something because after all what's going on in the circumstances so why I'm saying all this is because you can read the story historically and find out the facts of the matter or you could run with the National Enquirer version that we're talking about right now what's going on here now David gets a chance to spend some time alone mourning first for Saul and then coming back and saying okay now I got a couple questions for you now tell me a little more about this story what happened exactly well you see he already knew what happened and he wanted to know something else beyond what happened how is it that you killed a king how is it that you killed a man that was supposed to be anointed by God and didn't fear if you're not afraid of killing that king I'm sure you're not afraid of killing me Poof, dust him now it's interesting David had someone else do it, which you know, you know, kind of, you know, kind of pulls me towards that Donald Trump thing. You know, it's like, well, Donald has a lot of people around him that he can just have them, you know, be take the blame for, and they'll fall on their swords because he's got a lot of followers. But let's get out of the political scene for a while. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. You, who, who me? I didn't do it, really, not me, man. How do you deal with guilt? Um, well, you know, it kind of happened like this. There was these Russians. Okay, forget the Russians. There was this, you know, like a uh, wallet, you know, just kind of sitting there calling out my name, you know, and told me that uh, uh, we don't know whose it is. And I looked at it and there was no license. Okay, maybe there was a license, but I threw it away, you know. But there was no license except for back over there, you know, on the ground. But, you know, I found money, you know, you know, it was like, um, whose is it? Who knows? You know, I don't know. My money now. <laughs> How do you deal with that? Or, you know, hey, you know, um, wow, look what's happening down there. That woman's getting beat up. Or, hey, you know what? That pimp is pop. That pimp is promoting prostitution. Let's let it go on our street corner. Or, hey, those government officials are lying through their teeth. Let's let that go, too. What do you do with sin in you, sin around you, sin all through the nation? Because that's where we're at now in this book. We're finding ourselves in a sinful situation. And the sin isn't just involving only the children of Israel, but the king of Israel. And everyone involved with him, even Jonathan. And only a few were spared, like David. But the rest got their pants beat, okay? They got, they got whooped. They got their armies, like, you know, nailed to the ground. And they kind of got, oh, so, like, uh, wiped out. Because Saul had overstepped his bounds. Saul had not done what the Lord had said. Saul had refused to be the king of Israel that God had told him to be. He says, I want to be the king of men, not a king appointed by God. And that's where we have to ask ourselves, what are you appointed as? Are you like in your job, fudging the books? I mean, I've done it. I've been in a bookkeeping situation where, hey, I got told to fudge the books. I fudge the books. I had the uh, auditor right here watching me fudge the books. It was legal before Enron, but that's what I did. Welcome to, to Toshiba America Electronics Components. Sorry, Toshiba, uh, you come back at me. You know. <laughs> but at that time, we didn't have you know sales and our computer system went down and we had to like you know million dollars here and a billion dollars there. We gotta somehow make them work, you know, so we'll, we'll fudge the books. Oh yeah, that was a sales order. Well, who signed it? Nobody. <laughs> I'm the one who wrote it. <laughs> is that illegal? Yeah, that's like, okay. okay. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's right. Is it ethical? We don't talk about ethics here. Oh, okay. You know, I mean, that's what it was. And it is. And I did it. And it was legal. Now it's not. 
Should I have done it at the time? Well, at the time, I didn't even know I was going to be asked to do it. <laughs> I was like, at the moment, okay, I did it. Wrong thing to do. And I, I paid for it later, you know. I mean, eventually I got broke again, and I just felt like it was kind of like I reached what I sold. One time I was making a lot of money and practically no work, and then all of a sudden I was like out of work and no money. Kind of fit the balance scales things with God. And that's where you have to ask yourself, you are anointed. Are you going to be like Saul? Or are you going to be like the guy who kind of like, ah, I'm caught. Maybe I'll just tear my clothes, you know, and I'll kind of mess up my hair, you know, and I'll act like, like, oh, God, you know, it was such a bad thing, you know. Unfortunately, he was so bad off, I killed him. Or it was such an easy thing to, you know, everyone was doing it, so I did it. Or the gun, it went off by itself. Never mind, I shouldn't have had the gun in the house to begin with. Or even owned a gun in the first place. But, oh, they got my gun. They stole it. Really? Your house, your gun, your safe, which you should have had, your locks, which you should have had, your keys, which you should have been in control of, and they stole your gun and you got them shot because you're the gun owner. What do you do when you sin? Do you admit it or do you excuse it? Give me grace. Give me grace. Forgive me. I'm sorry. Oh. What do you do? David was pretty forthright on it. Very clear. Simply asked a question, then he dealt with the matter. The question was, and David said unto him, How was it you weren't afraid to stretch forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And so David called one of his young men, go near, fall upon him, or go kill him. And he smote him, and he died. Fall upon him just means kill him. You know, it wasn't some 300-pound guy that just fell on him, you know, you kind of crushed him. No, they killed him. Because he had asked a rhetorical question, and that's what I'm asking you about your sin. It's rhetorical. It means, the rhetorical just simply means it's a bunch of rhetoric that doesn't mean anything. It's just asking a stupid question that doesn't have an answer because the answer you already know. You repent of your sins. You ask God to forgive. You admit you did it. I did it. I own it. My sin. Now, the one who has no sin involved in his life, the one who admitted to being sin itself, who took all our sins, has said we should be like him. So shouldn't we take Donald Trump's sins and everybody else's sins and the sins of America and say it's my sin, my fault, I elected the sucker in office? Well, I'll say it. I elected the sucker into office. Never mind, I've never voted, but okay. Hey, I'll take the blame. It's my fault that we've got a liar in office. It's my fault that we've got a crook. It's my fault we got a dishonest businessman, an unethical and immoral White House now. That every time you turn around, they're inventing a new story, an alternative truth, an alternative Trump, an alternative facts, an alternative whatever. But you can't get away from it. You see, you got to admit it sooner or later and take ownership of it if you did it. Because God holds you accountable. And so really, all I want to say about this study is that don't trump it. After all, David's going to come after you. But rather, just admit it. You did it. You're at fault. It's your sin. And then ask God to forgive you.